Hello, everybody. Welcome to DEF CON. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Michael Perklin uh, with ACL Stegonography. And uh, take it away. Thank you. You're welcome. How's it going, guys? And girls. I'm happy to be here at DEF CON again. Um, I, I think this, uh, this will be an interesting talk for those of you who are interested in hiding things or finding hidden things, uh, depending on if you're a black hat or if you're an investigator. Uh, my name is Michael Perklin. I'm a security professional. I'm a, a corporate investigator by, by, by my day job. Uh, I specialize in cybercrime. And uh, I'm a digital uh, forensic examiner. Basically, I take the computer geek side and I take legal support, sort of smash them together. Uh, that's what I do. Uh, in this talk, I'll be talking about uh, what steganography is, uh, and I'll go over some some examples that um, uh, some, some classical examples, not digital examples, uh, on how steganography was used before computers even existed. Uh, then we'll go through some digital examples to see how they work under the hood, and finally, uh, I'll I'll talk about ACL steganography, uh, which is a new scheme that I that I came up. That'll take up the the bulk of the presentation. Uh, so let's get started. What is steganography? Um, it's a, it's a Greek word. Uh, well, sorry, the origins of the word are Greek, and it means concealed writing. Um, th there are two two roots of the word: uh, steganos, which means covered or protected, and graphe, which means writing. Uh, I apologize if I'm butchering the Greek. Uh, I may have Greek roots, but I've never uh, spoken the language. Sorry, Grandma. Um, the term was first coined in 1499, but there are many earlier examples of where steganographic techniques uh, were used before the word even existed. Uh, basically, it just means hiding something in plain sight. Uh, so let's go through some classical examples. First example I want to show is a tattoo. Um, basically, the, uh, so somebody would take one of their slaves, and again, this is back in the day when people had slaves. Uh, they would shave the scalp. They would tattoo a message on the scalp, and uh, they'd wait for the, the hair to regrow. They, they'd send the slave over to uh, to the recipient of the message with a package, and as they were delivering the good. Um, when, when they'd find some, some private time, they would uh, shave the head, they would read the message, and uh, the message was delivered. So it looks like the slave is going there to deliver a package, but in reality there's a, a whole hidden message hidden under the hair. There's so, uh, a couple problems with this, uh, mainly that uh, the message has to be delayed because after you tattoo a message in someone's scalp, you need the hair to regrow. Um, there's also other problems with this scheme. Tattoos are permanent. Um, no regrets. Uh, another example of, uh, of classical steganography is using Morse code. Uh, uh, some people would stitch um, uh, 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 some longer stitches and some shorter stitches in, uh, on a jacket or a sweater or, or a shirt, and that, that would conceal a message on, on the person. Uh, the, the messenger would, would go, they would hand deliver one note, but uh, as the recipient would, would take the note, they would read the sweater and, and they would learn the second message, the, the, the true in, uh, intention of the, uh, uh, of the visit. Uh, here's an example of, uh, of a tapestry that was stitched by a prisoner of war in uh, 1941. You can, you can see um, uh, there are two borders with some dots and dashes, and uh, that, that was Morse code. Uh, so, so this prisoner of war was hoping that you know, by delivering the, this, this tapestry, they would get a, a message out saying, you know, I'm okay, or whatever. Uh, if you're interested in what the message uh, says, you can, you can grab the, the talk online, and, um, and you can decode it yourself. The next classical example is invisible ink. This is um, a very simple technique, but it's, it's quite effective. Uh, basically, you would use lemon juice or something acidic, and you would uh, write on top of a piece of paper um, with this liquid, allow it to dry, and then you would deliver the, the, the paper to your, to your recipient. The, the, the paper would have other writing on it, so it would look like it says one thing, but what happens is the acid in the lemon juice or, or the, the acidic liquid that you use breaks down parts of the paper. So when, when you put that piece of paper over heat, um, it, would, uh, it, it, would, it would start to burn, but the, the, the parts that were broken down a little bit more by, by the acid that you added, they would burn first. Uh, the result would be uh, it, it would turn darker, and you, you could read the message that was, that was written with the liquid. Uh, this is a lot of fun to do if, if, you've, if you've got young kids. I've done it with my, uh, with my nephews, and they've really enjoyed it. Um, now let's take a look at some digital steganographic uh, methods. First example I'll talk about is uh, photographs. This is one of the most common types of digital steganography. You can encode one file as color information inside a, a photo. Um, this, is, uh, this uses the fact that 
only superhumans can tell the difference between lemon and chartreuse. Uh, and by superhumans, I mean the fair sex in the audience. Um, each pixel is assigned a color with an RGB color code. And the very last bit of this color code will always be part of the secret message that you're encoding. So uh, the example I have on screen here is uh, DFFF00. Zero zero. Uh, that, that's chartreuse. That very last zero uh, is part of the message that you're encoding. Uh, another example is DFFF01. That's not chartreuse, but it's something similar. Um, so uh, the difference between the two colors is imperceptible to most of us. Uh, but if you look at the very last digit for all the, um, all the adjacent pixels, you can uh, rebuild a whole other file there. Uh, eight ad adjacent pixels yields one byte of encoded information. Audio steganography is, is a, a similar concept to the, 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 uh, the photographs, but it uses sound. And again, it's based on uh, the fact that humans can't tell the difference between 400 hertz and 401 hertz, uh, especially if the note isn't sustained for a long time. Uh, after each frame of audio, uh, one bit is, is, in, is encoded in that frame. And if you get a bunch of uh, audio frames, you can encode a bunch of bits, you get your bytes, and now you've, you've got your message. Uh, if you're interested in, in this kind of stuff, uh, I, I urge you to uh, take a look at uh, John Ortiz's work. Uh, he, uh, he's a presenter at, uh, at Black Hat. Some of his presentations are really interesting, and they, they go a lot further into uh, both um, photographs and, and audio uh, uh, steganography, uh, uh, more than just using one bit. Uh, there's some, some really neat math tricks you can do uh, to encode a lot more information. So look up John Ortiz if you're interested. Uh, another digital example I'm going to talk about is x86 ops. Uh, with, if you take a... Um, uh, a portable executable file or an exe file, you can encode information inside of it using, um, using operations that don't really have an impact on the program as it's running, uh, such as the NOP or, or the NOP code. This is an operation that does nothing. So if you have you know, three NOPs, that could mean one thing. If you have five NOPs, it means something else. Um, you can also use complementary operations, like um, add one and then subtract one. The result is nothing, but by having an add one and, and a sub one, that could mean something. Maybe uh, add five, sub five means something else. Uh, any any complementary operations would work, like multiplication and division. As long as, as you have some kind of a scheme to, to write this, it works. Uh, PE files or, or EXE files, they have a lot of other areas where you can encode information. Uh, this is uh, looking at, at some of the raw, hex, raw bytes in hex form of a PE file, and you can see that there's a lot of uh, space there where you can, you can jam data that isn't expected by the user, but it, it wouldn't impact the, the running of the program, but it would hide data. So uh, if you send this EXE to someone, they can, they can decode it on their side. The last digital example uh, I'll be talking about is uh, chafing and winnowing. Uh, this is probably the most interesting one for me, at least. Uh, it was conceived by Ron Rivest in 1998. He's the R in RSA. Uh, he also made the RC4 algorithm that uh, a lot of the WP stuff was, was based off of. Uh, chafing and winnowing isn't exactly encryption, and it isn't exactly steganography. It's sort of a hybrid of both, but it isn't really either. either. Um, it, has, it has properties of both. What happens is the sender doesn't only send his message. He also sends a bunch of gibberish as well. So anybody who's listening sees the message and they see the gibberish all at once, and, and they don't really know which one is which. But the sender is very careful that whenever he sends a piece of the message that is truly part of the message, uh, if you were to run a calculation on it, like a parity check or some other calculation on the contents of the message, it'll always come out to a certain value. And if you were to run the same calculation on one of the, the, the chaff packets or the, the non-message packets, it would not uh, yield the same result. So the receiver, whenever they receive a packet, they would run the same calculation on it. Anything that matches the, uh, the expected value must be part of the original message. And if they run the calculation and, it, and they get a different result, it must be part of the chaff, and then they can discard it. Uh, here's a visual example. Uh, you can see on the left there are, uh, there are four pieces of this message. Uh, and the, the contents of the message are the bits 1, 0, 0, and 1. And the MAC codes, uh, if you look at the MAC codes, all of them are even. Uh, this is the encoding scheme uh, for this example. On the right side, this is what Bob receives from Alice. And some of the, some of the packets have uh, an even MAC code, so those are the, the legit pieces of the message. The rest of the packets all have a odd MAC code. So Bob knows to discard these and only use the ones that have a even MAC code, and that must be the, mes uh, the message. You can reassemble those together and, and get the original message. 
All right, so we've talked about a couple of different types of steganography. Um, they all have something in common. They have three things in common. Number one, you need a medium of arbitrary information. The medium could be your scalp, it could be uh, a tapestry, it could be uh, a photograph. You need to have a key or a legend, uh, a, a way to encode data. If you um, encode this this way, it means that. If you if, if you write that, it means something else. And finally, you need a way to differentiate between this encoded information and the rest of the medium information that is expected to be there. So th these three things make up steganography. And with that, uh, let's talk about ACL steganography, the the, the scheme that, that I developed. Uh, it's a way to encode files as access control entries within an access control list on a file on an NTFS file system. That was a mouthful. Uh, the medium is any file that's on an NTFS file system. Uh, the key is security identifiers within the access control entries and the differentiator between the, the, the message and regular stuff is access control entries with an unlikely combination of permissions. Before we get into more of how the scheme works, I want to uh, backtrack a bit and talk a bit about how NTFS security works under the hood just so that um, we, we can understand how the, the scheme works. So on screen here are, are uh, two images. The one on the left is the security tab of the properties window for a file. This shows that there is a user, Michael, who has read and execute permissions on the, the, the file that has been right clicked. On the right side, uh, we see the computer management window. This is where Windows adds users and you can manage the users. And there is a user, Michael, there. When I'm pulling up the, the properties for this file on the left here, uh, Windows, uh, Windows doesn't store the, uh, the, the permission entries by name. They, they don't say that Michael has read, write, uh, and execute permissions. They say that security identifier 12345 has the permissions. As I'm pulling up this property window, Windows will take a look at the users. We'll see that security identifier 12345 matches with user Michael. So it displays Michael nicely for me so that I'm not really confused. Uh, I know that Michael has read and execute permissions. There's a lot of permissions that uh, you can set for, uh, for a user, a lot more than just the, the five or six that you see on the, on the left screen. Uh, there are 22 unique permissions in all. However, they, they are stored in only 14 bits of information. Uh, this is because a lot of these uh, bits are reused depending on what, what you're uh, setting a permission on. For example, uh, for directories or folders, if you have the, the ability to traverse that directory or to open it up, uh, that, that, that's one uh, uh, permission you need to track. But you don't traverse a file or uh, list the contents of a file the same way that you do with a, with a directory. So uh, some of these bits are reused depending on if you're looking at a folder or if you're looking at a file. Um, there are a, a bunch of unused values which I, I assume are, are left there for, uh, for future expansion of NTFS. Um, but as you can see on screen, there's a lot more granular permissions than just read, write, and execute. Um, uh, uh, this, this slide here shows the difference between the simple and advanced view of the permissions. On the left is the, the file that, uh, that I was showing earlier. And on the right, you see quite a lot of permissions. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how well you can see all the, um, uh, all the entries on the right. But there, there's a slash there that shows that one bit would, would be used for either traverse folder or for execute file. It's the same bit, but depending on if it's a folder or a file, it has a different meaning. So I mentioned uh, security identifiers. Permission entries are stored using security identifiers. Uh, if a user is removed, the operating system can't look up the friendly name to show in that dialog. Uh, this is the same file with the same Michael user who had read and, and execute permissions, but I've deleted the Michael user from the operating system. And you can see here that uh, the, the top entry in the list, it says S1 yada yada yada. That is the security identifier for the user Michael. And because Windows can't look it up, it can't display Michael. So uh, this shows how that NTFS stores all these permissions by identifier and not by user. Let's talk a, bit, a little bit more about the identifiers. The, they have a maximum size of 68 bytes. Uh, the, the, the first few bytes uh, are, are pretty much static. Uh, the, the first byte will always be one. That's the revision number. Um, Microsoft hasn't released a second revision of, of these security identifiers. Uh, the second byte is, is the count of the number of sub authorities that will be in the rest of the SID. Um, the maximum uh, number here is 15. Uh, that, that, that's the most you can, uh, the most amount of, uh, sorry, the highest amount of sub authorities you can fit into a security identifier. The next six bytes are used for an identifier authority. Uh, 
it, 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 there's uh, too much about that to go in, into uh, great depth in this talk, but for our purposes, we can just say that the value will always be 4. And finally, the last 60 bytes store the contents of all the sub authorities. All right, we've gone through a lot of acronyms, so let's do some acronym review or some AR, as I like to call it. Um, there's an access control list or an ACL. Uh, that is a list of access control entries. There's an access control entry, an ACE, which is a permission rule, which says allow these permissions for this SID or deny these permissions to this SID. And finally, there's the security identifier, the SID. That is a unique identifier for that user or group of a Windows system. All right, enough slides. Let's, uh, let's do a quick demo. This is the part of the presentation that I was most worried about everything breaking, but everything looks okay. Nothing crashed yet. Okay, so this is a, um, a, a Windows VM. Let's um, put it in full screen so we can see a little bit better. All right, so I have prepared a file that I'm going to encode using this ACL, uh, ACL steganography scheme. I'm going to encode a true crypt volume. So I've created a true crypt volume, and that's this here, the local disk T. Inside I have a Bitcoin wallet. Uh, it's just a, a simple file that holds all, all my Bitcoin uh, keys uh, for this, uh, this example. I'm going to encode this Bitcoin wallet and hide it in my file system in a way that cannot be easily found by a forensic investigator. So let's uh, dismount this true crypt volume because we want to make sure it's not in use before we encode it. All right, now that that's done. I have also prepared. Okay, so here's the TrueCrypt volume that I will be um, encoding. Uh, I need to put this file into ACL uh, entries on a set of files. So I've prepared 16 text files that I will be using to, uh, to hold this, uh, this TrueCrypt volume. Let's take a look at the permissions of some of the files in here. I'll just choose number one. Um, right click properties, I will go to the security tab, and you can see there's default permissions here. Uh, authenticated users, the system, uh, nothing fancy here. So now that we know what the per permissions look like already on this file, let's encode some data into it. So I'm going to launch the ACL encode utility that I've created. We'll choose the file that I want to encode. In this case, it is the TrueCrypt volume. This is what I'll be placing into the ACL entries. Next, I have to choose a file list. This is just a simple text file that says um, which files should I use to, uh, to, to encode this data. So I'm going to create a file list real quick. I will go to the test folder. Let's take all 16 of these files will be in our list. And I will save the file list.txt right here. OK. So just so you can see what that, what that did, it created a simple text file with one entry for each of the files that I selected in that dialog. So I'm now going to encode the TrueCrypt volume into all of these 16 files. And it's as easy as clicking encode. It takes a little bit of time because as, as you can imagine, uh, it has to split up the file into a lot of different pieces and uh, convert these pieces into ACL entries and put each of these entries on all the 16 files that I've chosen. Um, for this example, it takes about uh, 27 seconds. I've, uh, I've timed it. Um, in addition to splitting up the file, it also needs to do a couple of other things, like add the security identifiers to um, a, a special part of the volume called the secure file. Uh, I'll go into more depth about that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, and there we go. The file has been encoded. So now, um, if we take a look at the test files, they, they look like they're regular files. But if we take a, a closer look at the security permissions, we'll notice that there's a lot more entries here than there were before. Uh, each of these entries uh, don't have an associated user account within Windows. So Windows can't look up a friendly name like Michael to display. Um, so all these values here are the, is the uh, Bitcoin wallet that has been put in the TrueCrypt volume. Now that we've written it, let's take it out. And it's the exact opposite. Uh, and this, in this case, I'm going to use, uh, change the target. Let's say out. So it'll make a true crypt volume underscore out. And we'll hit decode. Decoding is a lot faster than encoding. 
Uh, we see it started to create the file. It's chunking out and uh, shortly we should see that the file has been decoded and it has. So this is it here. You can see that the file size is the same, 292 kilobytes. Uh, let's test if it works. We will mount this using my super secret password. And there it is. Open it up and there's the wallet.dat file. So we've successfully encoded it and decoded it. It worked. Uh, come on. I'm having a hard time getting out of this uh, VM. <laughs> yeah, drink. <laughs> what? The key shortcut is not working. I'm trying Command F. There it is. Okay. Um, yeah, drink harder, I heard in the audience. Yeah, I think that deserves it. All right. Let's put Umpty Dumpty back together again. Get back to here. Okay, so we just went through the demonstration. Let's take a closer look at how this worked under the hood. What was the program doing behind the scenes? So, uh, the file that I encoded, it was a TrueCrypt volume. When I hit the encode button, it chunked the file up into 60 byte chunks. Uh, you can see there uh, 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 on the screen behind me, there are yellow chunks and blue chunks. In this example, uh, I'm only using a file list of two files just for simplicity. Uh, in the demonstration, I chunked it up into 16 files. So there would be 16 different colors instead of the two you see. But each chunk becomes an SID. Um, there are two files in the diagram, file one and file two. Uh, file one is on the left. The first chunk will be written as an SID in, and it will be encoded there. The second chunk will go to file number two. Third chunk will go to file number one again. Fourth chunk will go to file number two again and back and forth until the entire file has been encoded. Um, all the ACEs are uh, created with an allow permission and um, it, it allows that SID to do certain things. Uh, each of these ACEs are added to the ACLs for all the files listed in the file list. Um, it, well, when it's doing this, uh, the order is important because we need to know where chunk one goes, where chunk two goes, so that when we decode it, we, we reassemble all these chunks in the right order. Also, um, just like the, the chafing and winnowing e example um, that we went over earlier, uh, we need to know which ACEs are legitimate and which ACEs are my, uh, belong to my encoding scheme. So there's, there's a way that, that, that I do this. Uh, there are two bits set in every single pr uh, permission for an, uh, an ACL encoded entry. It's the synchronized bit and the read permissions bit. The reason why I chose these is uh, mainly because the synchronized bit cannot be set within the Windows UI. If you go to the security tab of, uh, of a file with, within Windows and uh, look through that long list of all the advanced permissions, you will not find uh, synchronized there. It's a sort of a, a hidden um, piece of Windows that's, that's, that's used for thread synchronization. Uh, it's used under the hood for parts of the Windows operating system and it's not uh, typically available to a user, although you can set it programmatically, which is what, I, which is what I've done. Um, and those two bits are uh, red in the diagram you see here. Uh, the, the green bits are what I use for encoding their po position uh, within, the, within the, the overall file. Um, th so the, the last nine bits are used as a counter uh, with values of 0 through 512. Uh, the first bit is, um, sorry, the, the, the first chunk will be encoded with, um, with a value of zero, the next chunk will be encoded with a value of one, two, et cetera. So it, it, can, uh, it can hold all these. Um, the file list that we're using, you remember the, the list of all the 16 files that I chose? That became, becomes kind of like a symmetric key between the encoder and the decoder because without that file list, you don't know what order all your, uh, all your entries belong in and you don't know uh, how, how, to, um, uh, how to reassemble them. So the list identifies which files on the NTFS volume have ACL encoded entries and the list also identifies the order in which those entries are encoded. Now as you can imagine, there are some limitations. Uh, an access control list can be no larger than 64 kilobytes per file. This is a limitation of the Windows operating system. Um, now each access control entry in the list has a maximum size of 76 bytes. That's 68 bytes to encode the SID 
plus an 8 byte for a header which says allow or deny and, and some other uh, details of, of that access control entry. This produces a theoretical maximum of 862 access control entries per file. Even though we can cram 862 entries per file, I've imposed a limit of 512 uh, per file. And this is mostly because uh, you need room for legitimate entries. Um, if, if you remove the ability for everyone to read a file or for the administrator to write to a file, you can't use that file at all. So there has to be some room for real uh, permissions. That's why I've imposed the limit of 512. Um, so w using these numbers, <coughs> excuse me, um, that means that the largest possible file that you can encode is uh, uh, by this calculation here, the number of files in the list times 512 times 60 bytes or about 30 kilobytes per file. Now, uh, so the larger file that you try to encode, you need to have more and more files in your file list to accommodate this. Each file in the list allows you to encode 30 kilobytes more data. Um, so if you need a larger file, use a longer list. There's another limitation, the secure file limitation. Now the dollar sign secure file, that is a hidden file that's on all NTFS um, uh, volumes. This file is like a mini database that stores all of the security information for every file. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's in C windows or you know, C users or any file anywhere on the volume, all of the permissions for every file are all crammed into this one file called the secure file. Um, now every time a new security identifier is encountered, Windows adds that SID to the secure file. It does this so that uh, in the future, if, if you're trying to re uh, read or write permissions of that file, your, uh, Windows will be uh, slightly optimized and it'll, it'll know that, um, th that it's there. It, it, it sort of uh, caches it. Now, NTFS does not remove old or unused SIDs from the secure file, even if all the files, uh, all, all the, um, uh, all the files that, permit, uh, that user used to be able to read or write um, ha have been deleted. So you can delete the, the Michael user. You can remove every single file that Michael ever had uh, permissions on, but the SID for Michael will always still be in there. Uh, it's designed to grow in size and never shrink. This imposes kind of a severe limitation. Every single chunk of an ACL encoded um, uh, file will always persist in the secure file forever. Uh, so the more you, you try to encode data, the more data will be uh, eaten up by your, uh, by your file system and you won't be able to recover this uh, even if you try to, uh, uh, to clean it up. Now if you do some manual hacking, you might be able to remove them manually from the secure file, but that's beyond the, the scope of this talk. Let's take a look at how this works um, or how this looks to a forensic examiner. Uh, I mentioned that I'm, a, that I'm a, a forensic examiner and I have access to a lot of forensic tools, so I figured what better way to test this than to t turn my tools onto it? So I took a two gigabyte USB key and I formatted it as NTFS, and then I used two of the most common forensic tools in the industry: uh, Access Data's FTK and Guidance's NCase Forensic. Uh, I use slightly older versions of these tools because they're they're uh, more widely known and more supported. But even the, the even the newest versions of the, of the tools uh, have this have the same results. So in order to do the test, I prepared uh, a couple of, um, of test files. Again, I, I created a folder with a bunch of text files as my, uh, as my list of files that I'll be using. And I created a, uh, a file list.txt which lists all those files. Um, then I created an input file. I wanted an input file that had contents that were nowhere else on the volume so I'd be able to search for it easily to see where it, it came up on the volume. Uh, so I created a four kilobyte text file with just DEF CON XXI repeated over and over and over again. This would allow me to, to search for it later to, to, uh, to find it. Let's see how access data is FTK4 um, held up on this. This is um, uh, FTK4. We're taking a look at uh, the, the list of all 16 files you, you can see on the, on the bottom half of the, uh, of, of the image. Uh, file number one is selected and FTK is showing us the owner of the file and it's showing us all the other properties of the file like the size and the date and, uh, that it was created, the date it was last uh, modified, et cetera, et cetera. But it does not show the access control lists. So I started hunting and pecking all throughout the program looking for where I can see the, the, the security permissions on the files that, that are listed in FTK. FTK lists a lot of different uh, fields within uh, NTFS that you're, that you're able to, uh, to view. None of these are the access control lists. 
So I found that FTK4 has no way to show what permissions were set on a file. Uh, I contacted their tech support and I discussed the issue with them. They, uh, they assured me that there was no way. I discussed it on their user forum uh, asking if anybody knew of a way to see uh, which users had permissions on the files that are, are being analyzed in FTK4 and the consensus was use another tool. So FTK4 cannot do it. Um, however, FTK4 can still analyze the, the dollar sign secure file and sure enough if you manually search through that secure file you can see some of the contents. Uh, this is 60 bytes of DEF CON XXI repeated. This 60 bytes is one of the SIDs for one of the files that, uh, that was encoded. So you can still see the data buried in the secure file but it's, uh, it's not in a, uh, in an easily presentable list. Um, and of course in this case I'm searching for a file that, uh, for values that I knew was in the input file because I put them there. Uh, if TrueCrypt was used or something was used that would uh, in encrypt the data in a way that I couldn't search for it easily, this would just be more gibberish and I would have no idea that this was part of an ACL encoded entry or uh, if it was just a, a random SID. Let's take a look at Guidance's NCase Forensic 6. Now in NCase Forensic 6 there are a couple of uh, different view modes you can have when you're looking at a file. Uh, right now we're looking at the, um, the, the home view of the entries list and you can see all 16 of the files listed there. File number one is selected on the right because uh, so that's the file that we're looking at. Um, now th the second arrow is the permissions tab. When you click on the permissions tab you can see the permissions of that file. And here you can see there's an, uh, there are uh, access control lists for that file. The very first one, S14 yada yada yada, that is the, per the permission list for that one file. Now if I want to take a look at, it, uh, at the permission list for another file, I have to go back to the home folder, choose file number two, then click back on the permissions uh, tab so I can view the permissions for file number two. I want to look at for file number three, click home, click file three, click permissions. It's a very manual process and no investigator has the time to manually inspect all the permissions for all the files uh, on an NTFS volume. Uh, and again if we take a look at the, the dollar sign secure file with an NCase 6, you, you can see the contents of uh, some of the SIDs. Uh, DEF CON XXI is shown, uh, shown there in the bottom left of the, of the photo. Uh, and in addition to the, the one SID that's highlighted, e there are two other SIDs that occur later in the secure file. Again, 60 byte chunks, each of them have DEF CON XXI repeated. So the forensic detection of ACL encoding, uh, it's a very manual process using the most common tools uh, in a forensic investigator's toolkit. Um, sure there are other tools that, that, um, that, that may be able to, to view access control lists uh, more readily but they aren't, they aren't the, the, the standard go to tools for forensic investigators. Now you can uh, detect some of these um, uh, using an automated way. Uh, NCase Forensic has a, a scripting language called Nscript. You can write some Nscripts to, uh, to automatically go through every single file, um, look at the, the access control entries, compare each of the entries with the SIDs that, that appear in the Windows operating system you're analyzing. If there are differences, so there, there are entries on a file that don't match anything on the operating system, well maybe this should be looked at. So, so you can automate a script to, uh, uh, to show everything to you in a nice way but that's um, over and above the, uh, this talk uh, and it looks like I'm out of time so I can't even tell you about that. Um, if there are questions and answers you can come see me in the uh, speaker Q&A room. I want to thank um, uh, Josh, Nick, Joel, Reesh and Kyle for their help in testing uh, this scheme. Thanks to my family, my friends, uh, my colleagues and special thanks to Eugene Filipowicz for seeding the thought in my mind. How can I hide data on a drive without detection? Thank you. Uh, it, it seems that I wasn't actually out of time. So if there are questions, I have 10 minutes. So I, if someone wants to ask a question, you can. Uh, come, come here, see this goon if you have a question and I can, I can answer. Uh, but in 10 minutes, I will be in, in the speaker Q&A room for um, uh, 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 better questions. Or, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, can we have the mic turned on, please, for the uh, audience? Uh, there Good. we go. So, would there be any way to implement this, say, into Mac OS's ACLs? 
yes, there would be a way to okay. uh, to add this to to, uh, to Mac OS. Um, now, the the scheme that I created was for NTFS um, uh, entries using SIDs. The way that that uh, that Mac OS uh, uh, use, they use an HFS file system. Yeah. You would have to encode it in a different way, but this scheme could definitely be adapted for that. Uh, it's just a matter of writing the tool to get it done. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Nice job, by the way. I'm sorry. Nice job. Nice job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right, so I got here a little late, uh, and I missed the porn entry point apparently in the beginning of the presentation. I'm uh, I'm sorry. I'm having a very hard time hearing that mic. Can you? Um, he, can't, he can't hear the mic. He said. Uh, How about right now? No. Uh, I, I I just hear echoes. I'm sorry. Here, okay, come on the stage. Yeah. Well, tell uh, me your question. Just asking your question, and you can repeat it. Yeah. So. That's a question. Well, my, my question is. So the question was uh, for, for streaming media. Um, uh, if, if you were to take a file and, and stream it, uh, let's say from a cloud, uh, can you use this encoded information and distribute it through, uh, through a stream? I would say no to that because um, this scheme uh, doesn't store anything in the file itself. It stores it in the metadata about the file that, uh, that the, the hard drive is holding. So all the, uh, the access control lists, this is within Windows. It's for the file. Once you start distributing the contents of a file, you're not even touching the metadata, so that's not going to be distributed. Hi there. So, so I guess my main question here is how could I avoid detection with this method when we're modulating communication in a well-known place in the file system? Why can't I just write something that computes entropy and automatically detect if someone's doing this? Because it's a deterministic place to drop in sub-channel or covert, command, covert com channel communication. So how, how would you compare this to then using TrueCrypt with a random offset deep in the file system where I've already randomized the free block? So this, this to me looks like it's immediately detectable by using statistical and standard communication entropy calculations. And maybe that's beyond the scope of this meeting, but I just, it's a curious question I have. It, it is a little bit beyond the scope. Um, as far as detection goes, um, as long as you're able to look at, uh, to see the entries, you'll know that there's something there. You won't know what is there, uh, but uh, you'll be able to tell that there is something. Um, now, as, as far as uh, encoding the entries in a way that would not be detectable, so it's a little bit more of a, a covert subchannel, um, you can always um, uh, adjust the scheme in a way so that each of the SIDs you create are valid SIDs that are in the operating system. Uh, but I would imagine that by doing that, you would be uh, you would have to uh, store much less than 60 bytes per uh, per chunk, which would mean you'd need far more values to store a much smaller file. Yeah, but I mean, someone in your position that wants to detect someone doing this, a traditional NTFS file system just has blank data in these areas. Now someone's jacking in a modulation into some bits that are unused ACL bits. It would, to me, it seems it would be immediately detectable because you're not burying it in with in the normal randomness pattern in the in the drive somehow. True. Right. It, it, um, it, it would definitely be detectable yeah. if you're looking for it. But uh, yeah. in most cases, you're not looking at the access control lists for the data that you're analyzing. I mean, if, if I'm doing, let's say, an intellectual property case as an examiner uh, to see, you know, did somebody uh, exfiltrate data from their company, I would look uh, for common things. You know, did they use a USB key to get data out? Did yeah. they email themselves? Did they do all these things? I'm not about to start looking at all of the access control lists on every file on their, on their desktop computer or on their laptop to see if they have encoded that information. Um, but uh, of course you can have a script that would automate um, uh, checking for these now that we know that this scheme exists. Uh, yeah. But again, it's, it's a cat and mouse game. Uh, you, you come up with a, uh, with a better uh, way of getting around the controls, well now you get controls to, to detect that. It's, it's, a, it's a cat and mouse game. All right, thanks. Thank you. Do we have time for one more? Uh, time for probably two more. Okay, two more. Uh, these are the last two questions here. I was wondering if you were familiar with uh, NTFS alternate data streams and if the scheme can work for files hidden through ADS. This is, 
sorry, do you say uh, NTFS alternate data streams? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Um, uh, I, I am uh, very familiar with it. Uh, both FTK and NCase support detecting uh, uh, alternate data in these uh, alternate data streams. Uh, for those who aren't, aren't, aren't aware of it, if you have a file name like let's say file list.txt and you double click the file, you're looking at the first stream of, of that data. It's possible under the hood uh, using some, uh, some command line tools, you can have two separate files that are both assigned the same file name, file list.txt. So you can take a look at the, uh, at the second one. Uh, do you know if those files uh, hidden through ADS follow the same uh, permissions? Sorry. Uh, do, do, the, do the files hidden through ADS follow the same permissions? Uh, hidden in, uh, oh. Uh, the, the question was, do these alternate data streams use the same permissions? And they do. It's because the, the permissions, uh, the access control lists are assigned to that file by file name. Whether there's one, two, or ten different alternate data streams within that file, they all have the same permissions uh, as, the, as the master file. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good question. All right, last question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, here. Well, uh, just okay. Uh, so the, uh, the dollar secure file ends up having all this extra junk. Have you considered using that as a place to put stego text? Since you can directly manipulate it, I mean indirectly manipulate it instead of directly manipulating the file. The question was about the the dollar sign secure file, and if you can embed stuff within the dollar sign secure file as a, a method of stego, that's actually exactly what ACL encode does. It, uh, it it chunks it up and it, it throws it in the dollar sign secure file. Um, but by adding an entry to a file um, on a hard drive, that SID gets put into the dollar sign secure file by Windows automatically. You don't need to manually put it in dollar sign secure. You, you just add an ACL entry and it will go in there by, because of Windows. Oh, but I mean that even if the file, if the files are deleted, the ACLs disappear, but the dollar secure file is still there with, with data that could be decoded if it were encoded in a, in a decodable way instead of reading the ACLs out of the files. That is the junk that normally accumulates there, that's entropy that that you can manipulate to store data too, and you don't even need the files anymore. You create the files and then delete them. You know, that, that, that's a good point. Uh, that sounds like a, a, a different application of this type of, um, of, of a scheme. Um, you know, I'd be, I'd be curious if you can if you write something like that. Um, that would just be a, a, a different way. Oh, repeat it? Sorry. Um, uh, he, he was saying um, within the, the dollar sign secure file, if you know that the, the um, that, that the data is uh, is in a certain way, and you can manipulate the data into a slightly different way to have a different message. D did I get your yeah, question? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. since that's a that is you, you brought it up as a way that it, the system leaks data. Why not exploit that, and then you don't even need the files. You can use create files with ACLs that puts data into that dollar secure, and then you just delete the files because the data isn't there anymore. It's in dollar secure. So now it's just this junk that accumulates, and uh, it just looks like the random stuff that normally accumulates there over the lifetime of the file system. Th that, that's, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's just a, a different way of doing it. But yeah, that, it, it would definitely work. Yeah. And then you don't even need the files; just delete them. That's right. You can you get rid of them. Uh, yeah. Okay. If we have time. Yeah. Um, so I think the technique by which you distribute it amongst multiple files pretty similar to OpenPuff, right? But uh, in a way, you know, you're using a different technique in terms of, you know, how you're hiding that data, let's say. Um, I think to dovetail on a couple of the other questions, you know, around alternate data streams, certainly you could maybe use something like stealth ADS, you know, to circumvent any kind of forensic, you know, detection of that. Uh, and I think in addition to that, you could maybe use kind of the volume shadow copies, you know, to, to hide data in the volume shadows too. Um, just as, you know, as another way to circumvent any kind of forensic Interesting. detection. Interesting. I, I, I wonder so. if I wonder if sh uh, volume shadow copies if they make snapshots of the access control list at that point in time as well as the data at, at that point in time. It's a great question. I don't know the answer, but <laughs> yeah, certainly worth investigating. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, yeah the, uh, I think what, what's clear here, um, and this goes back to the um, the, the, the summary slide of, of all uh, steganographic techniques. As long as you have those three things, a medium to store information. Uh, and a way to uh, differentiate between encoded information and legitimate information uh, and, and, and a key or a legend, you can encode information in anything. For example, how do you know that this pin on my left side means one thing instead of this pin on the right side? Uh, it, it could mean anything as long as both sender and receiver agree that this will have one meaning and that will have another meaning. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, that's, I think that's all the time we have yeah. for questions now. I'm going to be in the, um, the, the speaker Q&A room if there are any additional questions. Thanks for coming. Uh, well. 
Hello, everybody. Welcome to DEF CON. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Michael Perklin uh, with ACL Stegonography. And uh, take it away. Thank you. You're welcome. How's it going, guys? And girls. I'm happy to be here at DEF CON again. Um, I, I think this, uh, this will be an interesting talk for those of you who are interested in hiding things or finding hidden things, uh, depending on if you're a black hat or if you're an investigator. Uh, my name is Michael Perklin. I'm a security professional. I'm a, a corporate investigator by, by, by my day job. Uh, I specialize in cybercrime. And uh, I'm a digital uh, forensic examiner. Basically, I take the computer geek side and I take legal support, sort of smash them together. Uh, that's what I do. Uh, in this talk, I'll be talking about uh, what steganography is, uh, and I'll go over some, some examples that, um, uh, some, some classical examples, not digital examples, uh, on how steganography was used before computers even existed. Uh, then we'll go through some digital examples to see how they work under the hood. And finally, uh, I'll, I'll talk about ACL steganography, uh, which is a new scheme that I, that I came up with, and uh, the message was delivered. So it looks like the slave is going there to deliver a package, but in reality, there's a, a whole hidden message hidden under the hair. There's so a couple of problems with this, uh, mainly that uh, the message has to be delayed because after you tattoo a message in someone's scalp, you need the hair to regrow. Um, there's also other problems with this scheme. Tattoos are permanent. Um, no regrets. Uh, another example of, uh, of classical steganography is using Morse code. Uh, uh, some people would stitch um, uh, 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 some longer stitches and some shorter stitches in, uh, on a jacket or a sweater or, or a shirt. And that, that would conceal a message on, on the person. Uh, the, the messenger would, would go, they would hand deliver one note, but uh, as the recipient would, would take the note, they would read the sweater and, and they would learn the second message, the, the, the true in, uh, intention of the, uh, uh, of the visit. Uh, here's an example of, uh, of a tapestry that was stitched by a prisoner of war in uh, 1941. You can, you can see um, uh, there are two borders with some dots and dashes, and uh, that, that was Morse code. Uh, so, so this prisoner of war was hoping that you know, by delivering the, this, this tapestry, they would get a, a message out saying, you know, I'm okay or whatever. Uh, if you're interested in what the message uh, says, you can, you can grab the, the talk online and, um, and you can decode it yourself. Uh, the next classical example is invisible ink. This is um, a very simple technique, but it's, it's quite effective. Uh, basically, you would use lemon juice or something acidic and you would uh, write on top of a piece of paper um, with this liquid. Allow it to dry, and then you would deliver the, the, the paper to your, to your recipient. The, the, the paper would have other writing on it, so it would look like it says one thing, but what happens is the acid in the lemon juice, or, or the, the acidic liquid that you use, breaks down parts of the paper. So when, when you put that piece of paper over heat, um, it, would, uh, it, it, would, it would start to burn, but the, the, the parts that were broken down a little bit more by, by the acid that you added, they would burn first. Uh, the result would be uh, it, it would turn darker and you, you could read the message that was, that was written with the liquid. Uh, this is a lot of fun to do if, if, you've, if you've got young kids. I've done it with my, uh, with my nephews and they've really enjoyed it. Um, now let's take a look at some digital stegographic uh, methods. First example I'll talk about is uh, photographs. This is one of the most common types of digital steganography. You can encode one file as color information inside a, a photo. Um, this, is, uh, this uses the fact that only superhumans can tell the difference between lemon and chartreuse. Uh, and by superhumans, I mean the fair sex in the audience. Um, each pixel is assigned a color with an RGB color code. And the very last bit of this color code will always be part of the secret message that you're encoding. So uh, the example I have on screen here is uh, DFFF00. Uh, that, that's chartreuse. That very last zero uh, is part of the message that you're encoding. Uh, another example is DFFF01. That's not chartreuse, but it's something similar. Um, so uh, the difference between the two colors is imperceptible to most of us. Uh, but if you look at the very last digit for all the, co um, all the adjacent pixels, you can uh, rebuild a whole other file there. Uh, eight ad adjacent pixels yields one byte of encoded information. I'll take up the, the bulk of the presentation. Uh, so let's get started. What is steganography? Um, it, it's, a, it's a Greek word. I was, sorry, the origins of the word are Greek, and it means concealed writing. Um, 
th there are two, two roots of the word, uh, steganos, which means covered or protected, and graphe, which means writing. Uh, I apologize if I'm butchering the Greek. Uh, I may have Greek roots, but I've never uh, spoken the language. Sorry, Grandma. Um, the term was first coined in 1499, but there are many earlier examples of where steganographic techniques uh, were used before the word even existed. Uh, basically, it just means hiding something in plain sight. Uh, so let's go through some classical examples. First example I want to show is a tattoo. Um, basically, the, uh, so somebody would take one of their slaves, and again, this is back in the day when people had slaves, uh, they would shave the scalp, they would tattoo a message on the scalp, and uh, they'd wait for the, the hair to regrow. They, they'd send the slave over to, uh, to the recipient of the message with a package, and as they were delivering the good, um, when, when they'd find some, some private time, they would uh, shave the head, they would read the message.